morning and welcome to the Hudson Institute. My name is Hurska Petrovic and I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and the co-founder of the Forum for Intellectual Property at Hudson. I will be your host today during this panel discussion on drug patents and evidence-based policymaking in patent law. The potential impact of drug patents on healthcare prices has long been discussed among DC lawmakers who are looking for ways to reduce the cost of Medicare. Congress and agencies have held hearings and issued reports about the patenting practicing of drug innovators. And over the years, numerous le legislative bills have been introduced that would either limit patent rights on new drugs or would unleash antitrust enforcement against drug innovators. And I'm honored to introduce our panel today that will discuss the factual allegation and other arguments driving these calls for government actions. We have with us today the Honorable David Kapos, former Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the US Patent and Trademark Office, and now a partner at Cravat Swain and Moore. Adam Mossop, Chair, and my co-founder of the Forum for Intellectual Property at the Hudson Institute and professor, at George, uh, professor of law at George Mason University, and Erica Litzen, professor of law, University of Missouri School of Law. Welcome everyone. Um, so Erica, let me start with you. Could you briefly describe the policy debate on drug patents and drug prices? What, what is going on and what are, what are evergreen and patent tickets, which are terms that we are very often hear in this debate? Um, well, patent thickets and evergreening are loaded terms. People use these phrases to characterize a set of facts on the ground. They're a way to avoid being precise and bound to hard facts. For example, if someone says a drug company has a patent thicket, that person usually means the company owns multiple patents relating to a single product. And the person could say company A has five patents relating to its product. And really the most accurate statement would be that company A owns five patents relating to different inventions embodied in the product. But the term patent thicket is used instead to characterize the patent portfolio and obviously to imply that something nefarious is going on. And it's the same with the term evergreening. So as you, as you already said, Erska, that the policy debate here stems from concern that the US is spending more on healthcare than it should. And that this is driven by spending on brand drugs, meaning the initial products that are marketed typically with a brand name by innovators. And the patent thicket claim is that brand companies have more patents than they should, and that this makes it harder or more expensive or more time consuming for generic companies to get to market than it should be. The evergreening claim starts by saying that after a brand company discovers a molecule to treat a disease, gets FDA approval and launches, it continues to add patents over time. Sometimes it introduces new products, newer versions with differences that may have their own patent protection. The newer patents expire later in time than the initial patents. Generic companies don't get sales, the argument goes, because doctors prescribe the newer brand products and generic copies of the older brand products aren't substitutable for the newer brand products. And in, a, in an article called The Evergreening Metaphor, I reviewed every piece of legal scholarship and a whole lot of other scholarship relating to evergreening. And I dug into all the arguments and all the examples. And then in this article, I explain how FDA law and patent law actually interact. And that's what these writers are ignoring or sometimes finessing or even mischaracterizing. And then in a shorter piece called The Evergreening Myth in Regulation, I break down the myths that these people are perpetuating when they make these claims. And I wanna just tell you the three most important points from this work. So the first point is that people are ignoring fundamentals about patent law and patent protection. They say that drug companies are extending their patents, but the companies aren't. A patent expires 20 years after its application date. There's a small adjustment because of PTO review time and sometimes an extension because of the FDA process. But that's not what these people are talking about. They're looking at new patents and they are deliberately choosing words that imply a patent a company 
extends one patent when it gets another patent. And the patent thicket arguments reflect the same rhetorical sleight of hand. But a single drug product can reflect many different inventions and different patents protect different inventions. The second point is that FDA law and patent law work together in a way that means a generic company can work its way around everything except the active ingredient patent. In other words, it can take the regulatory shortcut, skip all the expensive testing that the brand company did, uh, um, even if it designs around the patents. And actually, it's often possible to get around the active ingredient patent itself and still file an abbreviated application. In these cases, the generic product might not be automatically substitutable, but it still benefits from an enormous shortcut to market, avoiding hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of work. And then the third point is automatic substitution is just a way to avoid marketing your own product. So yes, it's true. A generic company of the a generic copy of the first brand product won't be automatically substitutable when a doctor prescribes the second newer brand product. But a doctor can prescribe the generic drug, or as many do, just write down the name of the active ingredient. Generic companies promote to payers, and they could promote to doctors. And if a doctor writes down the name of the first brand product, even if that product isn't on the market, a generic copy of that product will usually be dispensed. So if the generic copy company is not getting sales, it's because the market is choosing the newer brand product. It's not because the branded company did something nefarious. Instead, the brand company innovated and apparently did something that prescribers value. So the bottom line for me is that a genuine and thoughtful policy discussion would require people to be much more principled in their choice of wording and in their claims about how the law actually works. Thank you. Adam, um, you looked at some of the drug patent numbers relied on by scholars and government officials in supporting legislation and antitrust enforcement actions. Could you briefly describe your findings? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Rushka, and um, it's great to be on this panel. Um, and um, I, I became interested in this topic um, uh, very much uh, uh, in line with uh, the types of comments that Erica just made in the sense that there's a lot of very loose arguments being thrown around. And, um, and we have been all been hearing for many years that there are hundreds and hundreds of patents that cover a particular drug. And anyone who knows anything about patent laws automatically is suspicious of those claims. And, um, <clears throat> and so I decided just to do uh, a, a spot check to look at um, some of these claims. The primary source for where a lot of this information is coming from is an organization known as IMAC. It's a policy organization um, that is very much engaged in the drug price and drug patent policy debates. It views patents as a primary source of why there are allegedly high uh, drug prices um, <clears throat> in our healthcare system. And, um, and they've been issuing these reports for the many years now where they assert that there are tens, if not sometimes hundreds of patents um, that cover uh, these uh, particular drugs. Um, we don't have access to their underlying data. We don't know their methodology. Their reports just list out um, the totals. Um, they do have some footnotes and some you know, comments in some of their reports where they, they, they comment on what they're looking at, but we don't actually have the data. Um, and so I just did, did, did a spot check, given that we don't have access to the data, to their final numbers versus some publicly accessible sources that we do have access to. Um, and these include two government sources. One is the FDA's Orange Book. The Orange Book is where, um, where uh, drug innovators have to identify any um, um, any patents that could be reasonably be uh, uh, be the subject of an of a patent infringement lawsuit if someone makes uses sells or otherwise uh, offers to sell a patented drug without authorization and so that's a pretty good starting place just to look to uh, to determine what actually are the numbers of patents um, that are uh, that 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 are read onto or cover a particular a therapeutic treatment that is being uh, sold to or provided to uh, to patients in the healthcare market. And I just, as I mentioned, just did a spot check. I took a look at several of them. So for instance, the Lyrica, 
a drug uh, uh, that, that treats a diabetes condition um, that's um, made by Pfizer. Um, IMAC claims that 68 patents cover it um, and that it has this extensive market exclusivity. So this ties into kind of what Erica was mentioning that there's lots of patents on it. There's this patent thicket allegedly. Um, and whereas if you look at the orange book at the FDA, um, they identify four patents. Um, and in fact, one of those patents is a reissue patent, which is a patent that has, which is uh, actually there, if you have a, a mistake in the form or process of a patent, you can surrender it to the patent office and, and have it reissued with a correction. Um, and so actually, in reality, there's only three patents <laughs> identified in the orange book. I mean, and that's a huge difference. Orders of magnitude, we're talking about 68 versus four. Um, and um, again, another drug that I took a look at, Eloquai, um, IMAC in a 2018 report identified 27 patents that are covering Eloquai and 48 patent applications and 20 in a new 2019 report that it issued and then up to the number of patents to 31 patents on Eloquai with 49 patent applications. Um, again, we don't really know again where they're getting this information from. We don't uh, we don't have that access to their data set or their methodology. Um, but when you look in um, uh, the Orange Book, uh, published by the Food and Drug Agency, it's uh, what you just see is uh, a three patents on Eloquai. Again, massive discrepancies um, between kind of official public sources of information and data on 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 what are the patents that cover particular drugs and the numbers that are being claimed by IMAC, which are being invoked by congresspersons, regulatory uh, authorities, I mean, even scholars uh, in both their uh, uh, articles and in testimony before Congress. I mean, by the way, the, the, this, the, the three patents too is also confirmed in a lawsuit that was filed by Bristol Mel Squid, the owner of Eloquai, um, where they only asserted several of their patents. The, there's no more patents that they asserted than those are listed in the orange book too. You know, patent lawsuits are another good source of, you know, of looking to publicly available official government sources of the number of patents that cover this, cover a particular drug, if only because, um, you know, uh, patent thickets and, and evergreening only works if there's a credible threat that we will assert this against you as an infringement lawsuit. And therefore, they're going to assert all of the relevant patents um, that they have, um, <clears throat> especially since defendants can invalidate a patent um, in, in litigation. And so you want to make sure that you actually are covered. Um, and I looked at a couple others as well, and I, fall, I found the exact same pattern where you had massive differences. I mean, massive. This isn't like, you know, within you know, margins of error. As I mentioned, differences of orders of magnitude between the numbers of patents that IMAC was claiming felt that covered a, uh, a drug and the numbers of patents that you actually find in government uh, official sources that are publicly accessible. And, um, and this is highly concerning, um, as I mentioned, because we don't have access to IMAX data set um, and we don't fully know their entire methodology that they use. They don't fully describe that methodology, uh, nor does it appear to be consistent between different reports. And yet these are the numbers that everyone is, 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 is going to and are invoking, including official government sources. So the House issued a report in December on, the, uh, on alleged causes of high drug prices, and they were citing IMAX numbers. Um, and yet there's serious questions about reliability um, and the lack of our, our, our ability to verify these numbers when you look at actual public sources of the numbers themselves. Thank you, Adam. And Director Kapos, are the issues about unreliable data that Adam mentioned or rhetoric that Erica mentioned, are those unique to the drug patent and drug prices policy debates or do we see this elsewhere? Yeah, thanks uh, Erska for the question and uh, thanks for inviting me to participate today. This is a really important topic and thanks Erica for your scholarship and sort of staying on the topic here. Um, uh, it's important that, that that these kinds of questions and accuracies, misstatements, mischaracterizations be um, uncovered and, and that we get transparency on them. Uh, Erska, coming to your question, you know, I wish it were that this issue is, you know, unique to the biopharma sector or just one unfortunate um, uh, report or something like that, but it's not. In fact, it's more, more or less, more than less um, ubiquitous. And you can go back to other charges, such as the charge that patent infringement lawsuits are running rampant. 
when the truth is that they've been on a downward, generally downward trajectory since around 2010 or so, around when the, the AIA came out and even a little bit before that. Um, another uh, uh, statement that's often made is that, uh, you know, patent trolls are the biggest challenge and problem in the uh, intellectual property world. And the truth of that also is that no, uh, uh, to the extent patent trolls were a significant problem, they were a significant problem circa 2007, 2008 or so. And then we had a whole series of events that occurred that did away with them um, uh, for all practical purposes, such that we're, we're down to the level of noise uh, claims that you've seen, that you see in, in any area of law in the US uh, where we want to have some ability for people to bring claims <coughs> and, um, and litigate legitimate disputes. So you can go across the patent world from, uh, uh, you know, from allegation to allegation. And what you see is there are narratives um, that are, are really unfortunate. I got, again, I can't help but give examples here. For those who've been to Washington, D.C. recently, you don't have to go far on the streets of D.C. before you'll happen upon a very large poster with a what appears to be a corpse with a tag on its toe and the and the uh, um, and the, the tag if i remember right has a patent number on it and the large caption on the poster says patents kill well that was a um a really scandalous um unfortunate ad that as i understand started out in europe by the folks who are supporting the waiver from the um, the trips WTO trips waiver from the uh, 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 patents that cover the COVID vaccines, um, and it's really unfortunate because it's posters like that that get into the common discourse and that cause you know our moms and dads and brothers and sisters and you know spouses and kids and all that to believe that there's something wrong with patents, that the patent system is out of control, that it impedes innovation, that it kills people, and nothing could be further from the truth. So this is, in my view, all a, you know, not just rather unfortunate, extremely unfortunate politicization, um, weaponization of information, misinformation, um, that's all intended to draw the patent system, which is really our nation's you know, innovation support system. It's our 401k plan for our country that encourages long-term investments in innovation. And it's being made to sound bad. It's just really terrible, not based on data, not based on facts, but based on these memes and, and rhetoric and misstatements. Yeah, thank you, Director Kappas. Um, Adam, after you published your policy memo, Senator Tom Tillis uh, wrote letters last January to IMAC, to the FDA, to the PTO, expressing concerns about the reliability of the IMAX drug patent numbers and asking to asking right. you to disclose the data set and explain the methodology. And IMAC replied in early March, and Senator Thiel sent another letter on April 1st to the FDA and the PTO expressing further concerns about the IMAC response. Could you summarize what were the senator's concern, what IMAC said in response, and why Senator Thiel was not satisfied with the IMAC response? Yes, thank you. Um, and it, it, it's this has been kind of a very interesting and surprising kind of policy development to watch unfold over the past couple of months. Um, and so Senator Tillis, uh, prompted in part by my policy memo, um, and um, and also uh, a report uh, um, by uh, pr uh, Professor Chris Holman um, <clears throat> uh, on concerns, some expressing similar concerns about um, another. Uh, uh, source of information, the Evergreen Drug Patent Search Database at UC Hastings, run by Professor Robin Feldman, 
um, you know, that, uh, you know, that there was unreliable and unverifiable data that were, or, in, or claims that were driving um, uh, policy as opposed to, you know, verifiable, uh, true uh, evidence-based policymaking occurring. Um, so he wrote uh, letters um, on January 31st to, um, to IMAC um, and to the FDA and PTO, as you mentioned. Um, to IMAC, he, he noted um, the examples from um, my policy memo and, um, and asked IMAC a very simple question. He just said, would you please disclose your data set? Um, since you, it's a, you clearly have a data set, you, you're producing numbers from it. Um, so can you please disclose your data set since you are offering this uh, these numbers as a basis by which uh, Congress should make laws and, and regulatory agencies like the FTC should undertake an antitrust enforcement actions. You know, we shouldn't make sure that there's evidence-based policymaking. So we really need to make sure that we have access to the actual data to ensure that this is actually true and reliable. Um, and would you also explain your methodology um, uh, of how, you know, just basically explain like how you got your numbers um, from the data that you collected? Um, it wasn't, it was a pretty straightforward request. Um, he also asked uh, the FDA and the, and the PTO to also similarly investigate, um, you know, the claims uh, about drug patents um, and to try to develop uh, a, a public uh, official source of information that people could point to um, that would be reliable and, and identifiable. Um, one, of the, um, uh, one of the interesting things he noted uh, that I didn't, wasn't in my policy memo is how the Evergreen Drug Patent uh, Search Database, uh, like for instance, has multiple entries for aspirin, claiming that aspirin continues to enjoy market exclusivity uh, excluding generics, whereas he notes in his letter that we all well know that you know aspirin has been available in a generic form for over 100 years, <laughs> and you can buy very inexpensive bottles of it at your local drugstore. Um, so, um, so he, you know he just was highlighting this 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 concern about rhetoric and lack of reliable uh, facts, uh, uh, factual allegations. Be a driving real world policy that could have real world negative implications for innovation and for our innovation system. Um, and um, IMAC responded in early March. Um, and IMAC's res uh, response uh, could be characterized as a non response. Um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it's a three page letter that recites all of their claims from their published reports. There's lots of patenting. Uh, um, there's lots of uh, bad behavior going on. There's many allegations in the letter that they've repeated over the years about bad practices by drug innovators. Um, and, um, but they do not disclose their data. Um, they say, oh, well, we just did a patent search and this is really easy to do. Anyone can do this, um, you know, which is a very interesting claim because the whole point of the way that the patent thicket argument works is you have so many patents, you can't figure out or find which patents you might be able to infringe or not. And so, the, uh, so you're excluded from this thicket of too many patents. Uh, that you can figure out where you know where you can have generic entry or not. So well, so which is it? You can easily search the database and find out what what's what's covered and what's not, or is it that everything is just a mess of a tangled web of interlocking patents and you can't make sense of it, and therefore you don't take any action as a generic company? Um, they also don't disclose their methodology. Um, <clears throat> they simply say, well we make very clear that we're counting patents and patent applications. Uh, first of all, it's not clear um, in, their, in their various uh, reports. Um, some of their reports just say patented, number of patents on, you know, it's a column of numbers and with drug names listed next to them. Um, and uh, and um, <clears throat> they, and so it's not clear that they are necessarily counting patent applications, although they, they, they conceivably, many of us guess that that's what they must be counting because it's the only way they could get the types of numbers that they've reached. Um, but, um, but it's also uh, clear that they're not just counting patent applications. They're counting, they have to be counting abandoned patent applications um, because there's just not that many. Um, <clears throat> and um, 
And we do discover a couple other things, like for instance, they have a very interesting definition of market exclusivity. Um, so for instance, they make these claims about market exclusivity of drugs in which there already is generic entry. Um, I point, identified one uh, um, such uh, drug in my, um, <clears throat> in my, uh, in my paper, uh, Lyrica, where they claim that there's market exclusivity to 2038, where there was generic entry for Lyrica in 2019, about the, year, the same year they published their report. And um, uh, and they claim that you actually do not have true um, market competition unless there's four to five generic companies making the product in competition with the original drug innovator. Um, so, which is a which is a very interesting definition of market competition. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, that that would mean that there are many markets that are not that are not competitive according to IMAC, uh, not just in drugs. Um, and um, and so all in all, it was, you know, it was a very interesting paper because, you know, as I mentioned, Senator Tills had a very simple request, please disclose your data set, which they have, so they could easily just publish their data set and please just clearly explain your methodology. Um, and they, re did it, they responded with a three and a half page letter that does neither. Um, and it was really unfortunate that they didn't do that. And they just continued to engage in the rhetoric of, you know, claiming that there's patent thickets and evergreening and things of this sort when, the underlying concern is the reliability of their numbers, given the vast discrepancies between their numbers and the publicly available, publicly official sources of those numbers. So Senator Tillis, um, I think, uh, unsurprisingly responded on, um, on April 1st, um, not an April Fool's joke, <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to the FDA and the USPTO, in which he identified um, these uh, continuing concerns that I just kind of highlighted. He, identified the fact that IMEC was non-responsive to his initial request. Um, he actually identified the concerns about counting and including patent applications, in particular abandoned patent applications, um, as, as part of the total number of patents that cover a drug. Again, that's really significant too, because if your claim is market exclusivity, there is no market exclusivity from abandoned patent application. It's an abandoned patent application. Um, and so, uh, and so, and yet they are counting abandoned patent applications and saying, and, and, and kind of combining that in a very loose, in, in a loose way as uh, in the same way that evergreening is loosely defined or not defined the way that Erica mentioned uh, as patented in the sense of then creating this, 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 this veneer of, 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 of exclusion of competition that just doesn't exist. Um, and he, you know, and he identified, um, you know, other types of similar concerns about kind of what the actual claims are that are being made by IMAC that are actually not factually true. Um, and, um, and so this is, this is really significant. He, you know, he noted, it was noted, notable that he wrote to the FDA and the USPTO um, and uh, basically uh, indicated to them that he hopes that they would be a source of, of legitimate and objective data going forward. Uh, Erska, is it okay if I offer a comment and ask a, a question on that? So just to, you know, as a kind of a patent guy on in this group, uh, someone who has practiced in the area, um, for folks who maybe are not so much into the machinations of patent prosecution, we don't normally think of patent applications anywhere near the same as we think of an issued patent. Patent applications are still in front of the agency. Um, th the vast majority of them have their claims narrowed. Many are abandoned, as Adam already mentioned. Um, the vast majority have their claims narrowed. So when we look at a patent application, we, we, we would never put it in the same category as an issued patent. And I would say as a patent practitioner, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, I think I'd use the word disingenuous to lump those all together when it's so easy and objective and clear to, to bifurcate them and talk. If you're gonna try and be accurate and candid, to talk about patents in one category and then pending unabandoned applications in another category. Not to say those are unimportant, but they're in very different category than issued patents. Their claims are likely to change. They're likely to become narrower. Many of them get abandoned. Many of them don't wind up reading on the product or read on some very narrow aberration or extension of it or something like that. So that's just, you know, not referring to any one particular entity, but just from a patent perspective. Adam, the, if it's okay, the, the question I had is, um, this does all seem you know, weird to me, but I'm not an academic and, and you and Eric are, America, you may have a view on this question too. Um, 
it, it feels like it shouldn't be that hard to disclose a data set, first of all. So I'd be interested in both of your views on, is this like IMAC is refusing because it would cost them $100 million to disclose their data set or something? And it feels like I, I'm used to reading academic papers where the data sets are disclosed. It feels like it's more or less market, if you will, more or less standard among legitimate academics to disclose their data sets. You're both nodding your heads yes. I just wonder if you could talk about how common it is to disclose data sets, how hard it is, so we can, I can calibrate and others maybe on, you know, why maybe IMAC doesn't want to disclose their data set. Eric, I, I mean, I, you do um, a lot more empirical work than I do, but I'm happy to Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I mean, if they have the data, um, disclosing it is, is, I mean, effectively simply pushing a button. Um, I, it is clear from their footnote about their methodology in one of the big papers that some of their data comes from a private fee-based um, competitive intelligence company that lists patents. And um, so they paid for some of the data, um, but, uh, and I suppose it's possible they worked out a deal and got it without paying or at a, at a low rate in exchange for something about disclosure and use. But there, you know, we don't know, I guess is, is the point. I mean, I, I, I would assume that if they were being careful and, and, and proceeding as most academics would, they would ensure that, that the data that they got could be shared. Um, and uh, upon request, at the very least, if not when they first make the claims, a normal, a normal practice for academics is to share the data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, exactly what Erica said, just to kind of uh, uh, put a nice bow on the perfect point she made, right? I mean, sometimes um, researchers use proprietary data sets, but then they identify that. Um, they say, here's a proprietary data set. Anyone can go to this to this company X and pay X money and get it. Um, you know, if, if, if that was IMAX concern, they could have put that in their letter because sometimes that happens, especially uh, as I understand in STEM research, um, you know, uh, that sometimes they're, you know, they're, Company, uh, a particular university researcher is working under a, a, an agreement with a private company. Um, and so they're, therefore they have to keep some of the data private. Um, but then typically what that entails is then they have either, you know, they, they have a you know, non-disclosure agreement that they enter into with someone who asks for the data. But a standard practice in, in, um, in, in all scholarly research from STEM, even now into the social sciences, you know, um, well, you don't necessarily, you know, put your data set into your article because then your article would be 2000 pages long. Um, but, you know, but you, you can email uh, an author and, you know, and ask to see their data. And the norm is you provide your data because, because as a scholar, you're supposed to be making factually accurate claims and someone has to be able to verify that and replicate that um, and, and test it. So it's, it, it's not unusual for, Senator Tillis to ask uh, IMAC to disclose its data set. Um, and, uh, and moreover, even if it was, so even if it wasn't the academic norm, even if there was some different norm that, that, that IMAC could point to, IMAC is still trying to influence public policy. They're trying to enact legislation. They're trying to motivate agency uh, officials to take actions that would have negative impacts on, 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 le on legal persons in our country. And I mean, and at a minimum, you know, we would hope that, you know, there's evidence-based policymaking in this country and that therefore that, that Congress and or regulatory officials are taking action on the basis of actual real world truthful data. And, and, and if there's just secret databases that are, that are being done to motivate that, that's not that we don't, we don't know if that's the case. Uh, thank you, Erica. I have a question for you. In your opening remarks, you explained quite well the lack of clarity and other concerns with the rhetoric of fat and tickets and evergreen. Beyond anecdotal reports, are there any rigorous studies or other data um, that show that there is a systematic problem with drug patents? 
Well, this is a nice um, follow-up point, actually, to what the three of us were just talking about, right? Um, the nature of the data that are available. There are empirical studies and there are examples offered. Do they show there is a systemic problem with drug patents? No. So there may be some data collection errors. I'm working with a, a co-author, a colleague, I'll mention this in a, in a minute or two, uh, systematically reviewing one of the big data sets. And we have found errors, but the real issue it isn't those errors. The real issue is that the data don't show what they are being held out as showing. And I want, I want to explain this. So some articles, uh, empirical articles, count the number of patents associated with drugs. Some of them count both patents and something else, what's known as regulatory exclusivity. And I need to just explain what that is. Basically, these are provisions of FDA law that are unrelated to patents that prevent approval of generics for some period of time. For example, some protect the testing data that the brand company generated. So they're preventing generic companies from relying on those data for a fixed period of time. And just like patents, exclusivities can be awarded at the moment of first approval and then later for later innovations. But again, the problem is with the inferences that are being drawn. And I, I want to provide an example kind of like Adam did with Lyrica, but I wanna get a little bit more detailed so that everyone can understand what being precise and careful would actually show. So Gleevec, it contains a, a molecule called imatinib mesylate, and it was approved by FDA in 2001 for treatment of certain patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. The main study that I have concerns with, this is that the, um, well, the main study that I have concerns with has a public database, and that's the Hastings database that Adam mentioned a minute ago. And this database lists all the patents and exclusivities associated with particular new drug applications. And the author of this study works from the earliest expiring thing, patent, exclusivity, whatever. In this case, it was an exclusivity expiring in December 2005. So she works from that. And the latest expiring thing, which in this case was a patent that expires later this year, 2022, she counts the number of months between the earliest expiring and the last expiring, which is 198, although actually when we do the math, it's closer to 199. And she labels this added protection time. And the accompanying article refers, this, refers to this as extending the protection cliff. In reality, number one, that exclusivity was tied to a new use the company developed after approval. The initial exclusivity expired in 2006, not 2005, and the initial patent expired in early 2015. Number two, the first generic product was approved at the end of 2015, and it launched in February 2016, and it was substitutable. So it's misleading to take the first and last expiration dates and claim, or even just imply, that the company's subsequent patents and exclusivity somehow extended the period during which it wouldn't face generic competition. So how much time did Gleevec have on the market without a generic copy? 14 years, eight months, and 22 days, which is less time than a lot of other inventors enjoy. So sort of the short version of this is that these advocates are using first and last expiration dates relevant to a product to support a claim that brand companies enjoy a period, that period of time, without generic competition, and to say that this is far longer than any initial patents or exclusivity would have provided, and, and this, of course, is key, longer than is acceptable in, in some kind of normative sense. So just so you know, uh, right now with Professor Christina Acree, who is a, um, an economist at Colorado College, I'm working on an article right now that explains that the real question that policy me policymakers need to focus on is when do these brand products actually face generic competitors in the market? And we are working on a robust empirical study that reports on exactly this question. And the Gleevec example that I just gave you is from our database. And I'm hoping, planning for this work to be done and shared in the in the summer or maybe early fall. 
Erica, is it okay if I ask a question? Erica, yeah, that's yeah. a super interesting example. I saw data a while ago, but I just wonder if, if I've got this right, that the average drug winds up uh, getting somewhere around 13 years plus or minus exclusivity. So if you take across the whole right patented drug grouping, probably hundreds of them, it's nowhere near 20 years. It's more like 13 plus, is that right? Yeah, that is right. And actually I have another empirical piece that looks at this very question um, looking at all the drugs that have gotten patent term restoration, that's the additional time to make up for FDA review. And uh, going all the way back to 1984, and what we found was that even with this patent term restoration in place, the companies are, are at a sort of 12 to 14 year period of actual in practice exclusivity in the market versus patent protection and exclusivity. And there are lots of other studies that show exactly the same thing that's fully consistent with the other empirical work that's been done. And for people who are watching who may not be super familiar with the patent system, so um, patents currently, um, and since the, since the AIPA, I think in 1999, if I remember right, have a term that lasts for 20 years from filing. It takes the average patent about three years to get granted. So the effective term for the average patent is around 17 years. So what we're saying is that for drug patents, the actual term is significantly less than 17 years. And by the way, if you're wondering why 17 years, before the AIPA of 1999, um, since I believe 1836, the term of a US patent had been 17 years from issuance. Right, so that goes back a long, long ways. And that's just a decision that was made by Congress actually based on uh, even previous English statutes from England that determined that you know, rough justice, uh, a term of a patent should be about that long. So you know, net, net, it, <coughs> as I understand it, it's just not true to say that pharma patents in general get extended exclusivity. They actually get somewhat less exclusivity than most patents. And if I could just follow up on that. So what, what, we, what we've learned, what we know is that once the drug product gets approved, the, the active ingredient patent, which is the central one that is likely to actually preclude a perfectly substitutable generic copy, even with the extra time, the, the extension, that patent expires 12 to 14 years after the brand product was approved. In addition, the separate finding is that they face generic competition around that same time too. So in other words, that confirms the intuition that it's really just the active ingredient patent that is the key. And any subsequent innovations, changes, new developments are not preventing a generic copy from being approved and launched on the market. Very interesting. Well, I actually have a follow-up question, Erica, for you again, but what, what about insulin? Senator Elizabeth Warren, Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and others said that insulin is expensive because of evergreen by patent owners. Is that correct? Is insulin in itself protected by patents? And have, could you share your views on this? Yeah. I love this example. I, I, I did a lot of work on the history of insulin when I was in private practice. It's really interesting. So first of all, so everyone understands insulin is a hormone that is made by your pancreas and people who have diabetes either don't make it or they don't make enough or they don't make enough at the right time. And there's basically three things to know about Senator Warren's claims and the, the general claim about insulin patents. So the first one is we're actually talking about a whole lot of completely different products with completely different clinical profiles. And so it's really a story of important and continuing innovation for the now 37 million Americans who have diabetes. So a drug containing insulin for these patients was developed in the 1920s. It was made from bovine and porcine pancreas, in other words, cattle and pigs. It had a dramatic effect, but it had to be administered by injection several times over the course of one day. Over time, researchers figured out strategies to make these animal-derived insulins act longer in the body. They added another protein, they added zinc. But animals, animal-derived insulin products, 
Well, insulin derived from animals is not the same as human insulin made by your pancreas. The amino acids aren't the same. And as it turns out, the amino acids actually really matter. They affect how fast the insulin is absorbed, how quickly it works, how long it lasts, and so forth. So then came the biotech revolution, right, in the 1970s, 1980s, and companies were able to start creating insulin products that had exactly the same amino acid sequence as human insulin. So those came out in the 1980s. The naturally derived insulins from cattle and pigs came off the market in part because there were concerns about safety issues tied to the animal sourcing, and in part because, well, the real thing, human insulin was now available. But diabetes varies a great deal and patients have differing needs. So companies then began tinkering with the amino acid sequence to create products with different clinical characteristics. So some of these insulin analogs are very, very short acting, which can be important in an emergency situation. Some are very long acting and different ways of making them long acting produces different variations on long actingness. And then it, people started experimenting with different de delivery methods so that you wouldn't have to inject yourself all the time. So the point is that this is a classic example of companies developing new, completely different products that are tailored, tailored to specific clinical profiles or that are, that are better off, better than what was available previously. So the second thing that you need to know or that everybody needs to know is that we didn't have insulin copies for a very long time because of the science. As early as the 1990s, FDA and the industry were struggling to figure out whether it was going to be possible to make the showings required for generic drug approval for the ones that had no patent protection. It's a protein and it, our ability to copy them and show that we've copied them has come a long way since the early 1990s, especially in the last 10 years. And FDA was not willing to accept generic applications. It said, well, you could try to do a different kind of abbreviated, abbreviated application, but you're gonna have to submit a lot of clinical data and we're not exactly sure yet. So no, wait, hold off. And it wasn't until very late in the first decade of this century that regulators around the world started mapping out exactly what you would need to market a, an insulin copy. And then of course in 2010, Congress changed the law. So the generic companies making these were gonna have to satisfy a different standard in a different statute. So third though, the first product from a generic company, the first insulin product from a generic company was approved six years later in 2016. And it launched in December of that year. And we call them biosimilars, not generics, but there are several available now and several that are actually designated by FDA for automatic substitution. So, so the, for me, the bottom line for insulin is that policymakers and others like to point out to insulin came, coming out in the 1920s and then insulin products today that have patents. And they say that patents are the reason we spend so much time, so much money on insulin. But number one, these are utterly different products. Number two, the delay was because FDA and others couldn't figure out the science for copying them. And number three, there are copies on the market now. Any reactions? So, I mean, well, that was just so fantastic. I can't believe you did that in like five minutes where you just kind of summarized perfectly. It, there's, it's a complex legislative regulatory overlay on top of the patent system. And it's just that the patent system becomes the easy go-to excuse for people who want, who have something that they just want to be able to point to a single thing and say, that's the problem. Um, when it's, it's, it's a wide, you know, it's, it's, it's a wide ranging multivariable uh, um, complex policy issue. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And thanks. Just thanks Erica for doing the work to yeah. unmask all of that and to explain it so clearly. I mean, and I, we can all just understand how unrelated these issues are. We all care about drug prices and insulin prices, and we want them to be reasonable and we want everyone to get access to them. But the, as you're explaining, it's got nothing to do with the patent system. The patent system is completely unrelated. And in fact, many of these treatments, I'm sure wouldn't even exist in the first place were not for the patent incentive that caused um, innovators to be able to invest in them. So then, you know, for the drug that doesn't exist or the insulin that doesn't exist, you can't price that at all because it doesn't exist. So it's a, just a weird, unfortunate, fact-free environment we find ourselves operating in here. And the insulin example is a great one. And 
Director Kappus, let me go back to your initial remarks. You place this debate over drug patents and unreliable data claims in their broader context. And what do you think is the best or perhaps worst is a better word example of an alleged factual claim that has driven patent policy that has proven to be false? Well, I, uh, uh, both Erica and, and Adam have now cataloged a number of them uh, with this IMAC discussion that we're having. But um, Erska, I would uh, take it back, in my view, in recent memory to the COVID crisis and, uh, and the claims that uh, patent positions by the creators of the now life-saving um, uh, you know, mRNA drugs were to blame for um, vaccines not reaching populations in the world fast enough. And a number of us, including myself, felt from the very beginning, even before, to be fair, even before we had all the facts, that that couldn't possibly be the case, because we were seeing agreements formed by many parties and the patentees making their patents readily available in the case of Moderna, I believe even declaring they wouldn't enforce their patent position. And we knew from past experience that the real problem with making drugs available in the developing world um, is last mile distribution, lack of trust of the medical um, infrastructure, lack of proper refrigeration, lack of um, medical professionals to administer, inability to follow up, uh, trust in government because of endemic corruption, the list goes on and on and on. But you'll notice none of those has anything to do with patents. And so we were all concerned, a number of us were writing on the topic. And then the data started coming out in more recent months um, this year, uh, showing that, in fact, like the Serum Institute of India was declaring, stop shipping more coronavirus vaccines. The world is awash in them. Um, the South Africans stood up and said, please don't send us any more. They're going bad here. We've got more than we can use. And it became vividly clear, nakedly clear, that um, the problem with distribution, as tragic as it is, and again, I would pause and say, I think I can speak for everyone on this call, we want everyone in the world to get vaccinated. We want it to be available. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is being honest about the, the, the logistics problems, the real problems, and not blaming them on something that's irrelevant, the patent system in this case. So Erska, you know, coming back to your question, um, all of these are, are tragedies in, in um, failing to help policymakers focus on the real problems causing them to focus on things that not only are not the problems, but are the solutions to the problems, which is really, really unfortunate, um, and, and costing lives in the meantime, while we're distracting policymakers from focusing where they need to focus. I can't think of a better and frankly more tragic example than uh, the WTO TRIPS waiver over the COVID vaccines. Yeah, thank you. Any, any comments on that? I was just thinking that the uh, the billboard that um, that David mentioned in Washington D.C. should not have a, a body with a tag that says. Uh, and what did you say it said? Patents. Pat patents kill. Keywords. Kill. It should actually be something um, such as focusing on patents when it's not the problem, when they're not the problem, kills. Mm. <laughs> exactly. I think um, what. Director Kappus and everyone here agrees is that the rhetoric matters because only if we get the rhetoric and the data right, then we can address the problem and ensure that everyone has access to this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah just lastly, Erska, it's, you know, we're, as Adam pointed out, but I'll come back to it, you know, we're not just talking about sort of casual comments in cocktail conversation, we're talking about the Congress of the United States of America that is making, trying to do a good job to their great credit of making laws that will benefit patients, that will cause patients to get treated at reasonable prices that will balance the need for innovation with the need for access. And to think that we're feeding them bad data, um, false data, uh, it's scary. 
Well, with that, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our discussion. I would like to thank our panelists. Uh, I have really enjoyed this discussion. I have learned a, a lot and I'm sure our viewers have too. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and hope to see you soon at the Hudson Institute.